It's called An Editor's Advice for Writers and subtitled The Forest for the Trees. It's by a well-known editor called Betsy Lerner, who has had more than 20 years in the industry as an editor. It's a book I've come back to again and again because it has so much useful information that we can all glean benefit from or take benefit from. But the book starts with the idea that none of us decide halfway through our careers we want to be a writer. It by and large starts in childhood. It's an idea that it sits within us, within our mind. And I was going to say it festers, but I don't mean it like that. I mean that it it's, we have the kernel of an idea and that that idea will grow and grow and grow into something larger as we move through childhood. Let me start with this little section from chapter one. Do you have a new idea almost every day for a writing project? Do you either start them all and don't see them to fruition or think about starting but never actually get going? Are you a short story writer one day and a novelist the next? a memoirist on Monday and a screenwriter by the weekend. Do you begin sentences in your head while walking to work or picking up the dry cleaning? Sentences so crisp and suggestive that they make perfect story or novel openers, only you never manage to write them down. The idea of this book is that Betsy takes us through the process of focusing on our project, working on it, rewriting it, discussing it with our editor, taking the lessons and the guidance on board that is shared with us by that editor, and then turning out a finished manuscript that is ready for publication, that may be ready for sale as an indie author, that may be ready for purchase by a publishing house who will then get behind the promotion aspects of that book. In this early section of the book where she talks about the mental health and the neuroses and the state of mind of different writers, she says, The dictionary's definition of ambivalence is the coexistence of opposing attitudes or feelings such as love and hatred towards a person, object or idea. For most writers, writing is a love-hate affair. But for the ambivalent writer who cannot attempt, sustain or complete a piece of writing, the ambivalence usually shifts back and forth from the writing to the self. The inner monologue drums away with, I'm great, I'm rubbish, I'm great, I'm rubbish. But the writer with publication credits, good reviews and literary prizes is not immune to this mantra either. In fact, she says, the only real difference that I've been able to quantify between those who ultimately make their way as writers and those who quit is that the first group were able to contain their ambivalence long enough to commit to a single idea and see it through. Here she says, it never fails to surprise me in conversation with writers who seek my advice as to what they should write, how many fail to see before their own eyes the hay that might be gold. Instead of honouring the subjects and forms that invade their dreams and diaries, they make up some ideas when they're talking to me about writing conferences about what selling or what agents and editors are looking for as they try to fit their odd shaped peg into someone else's hole. There is nothing more refreshing for an editor than to meet a writer or read a query letter that takes him completely by surprise, that brings him into a world he didn't know existed, or awakens him to a notion that had been there all along, but he had never much noticed. Some of the most striking and successful books in recent history were clearly born of a writer's obsession and complete disregard for what supposedly sells. Few editors would have gone for a queer book about a little-known murder in Savannah that took its sweet time describing every other quirk of the city and its inhabitants before addressing the crime. Whatever John Berendt was thinking when he set out to write Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, it couldn't have been the bestseller list, because almost anyone in the publishing industry would have told him that nobody would care about the story of a gay antiques dealer who languished in jail after shooting a cheap hustler. The book does, however, draw on Berent's strength as a reporter, as a travel writer, and as a southerner with a gothic sensibility and a taste for the macabre. As writers, it's easy, and I know this myself, to think, I've got a great idea, I want somebody to buy it, I want to publish it myself, or I want to sell it to a publisher, as I've done in the past, and I think it's a great idea, but can I finish the book? Can I 
commit to a timetable, a deadline to get that book finished and into the hands of an editor so that they can sell it to a publisher. Have you had that sense that you have this great idea, you want other people to read it, you think you have a voice that's appropriate for the story that you're writing or the non-fiction you're creating and you want to be heard? Something that Betsy Lerner says in this book is about the fear we have as writers of success, but also the fear we have of failing or of not having our book published. It's important to remember that success and failure are only part of the equation. The making of art and the selling of it are two entirely distinct enterprises. Any number of great writers have not received the appreciation all artists crave, just as in every generation any number of so-called hacks go on a tremendous commercial, if not critical, success. In his lifetime, Charles Dickens, who published his novels serially, was considered a hack. Emily Dickinson saw only seven of her hundreds of poems published. Jane Austen published under a pseudonym for her entire life. Artists such as Virginia Woolf, Hart Crane, Sylvia Plath and John Berryman, who took their lives in mid-career, never knew the press, the cultdom, the prizes and the canonization that their work would later receive. The ambivalent writer is often so preoccupied with greatness, both desiring it and believing that every sentence he commits to paper has to last for eternity, that he can't get started. I've talked in quite a few of my videos about the whole idea of procrastination and how we are held back by, oh, I'd like it to be better. I'd like it to just have a few more thousand words before the story wraps. I would like it to have richer characterization. For heaven's sake, get a book published, get a book finished, get a book in the hands of your readers so that you actually have something out there in your catalogue before you write book number two. Today, too little is made of all the writing that doesn't seek publication. The writing of letters, the sending of emails, the copying of recipes, the collection and compilation of journals and diaries, all the writing that mines our lives. Talking about writing is a creative process. Talking about the work that we do in bringing a manuscript to our editor. What Betsy says is this. The more popular culture and the media fail to present the real pathos of our human struggle, the more opportunity there is for writers who are unafraid to present stories that speak emotional truth, or that make such an intimate connection that briefly we become children again, listening or reading with rapt attention, the binding of our blankets pulled up to our chins. At a time when people are encouraged to follow their bliss, I suggest you stalk your demons. Embrace them. If you are a writer, especially one who has been unable to make your work count or stick, you must grab your demons by the neck and face them down. And whatever you do, don't censor yourself. There's always time and editors for that. And that's what this book is about. It's about developing the idea that you have, creating the story that is keeping you awake, that is filling your spare hours and forcing you to grab a pen and to write down the notes and, and to type up the, the story as it comes to you. The editor can always make good on a manuscript that you have brought together, that you've written, that you've compiled, the editor can make sense of that and prep it for the relevant market. It might be that you are, like me, a freelancer who sometimes uses an editor to tidy a manuscript. I can go through a manuscript, three or four edits, but after a while I know that I'm so close to the creature itself that I can't work out the different dimensions of its form. So having an editor is really useful. About that sense that we have to write, something that might have been there since childhood or through adolescence and into college days and the first years of our working careers and professions, Lerner says, writing is a calling and if the call subsides, so be it. It may return in greater force the next time around. Some people say that you have to write all the time to get anywhere and that the discipline will ultimately separate the men from the boys. But I assure you, you will never make yourself right. When writers say that they have no choice, what they mean is, everything in the world conspired to make me quit, but I kept going. Writing has to be an obsession. It's only for those who say, I'm not going to do anything else. 
If the voices keep calling, if the itch remains, no matter how punishing the work or inhospitable the world, then you must take a long, hard look at all the writing you've been attempting to do all your life and commit to it. Don't let publishers tell you that short stories don't sell if you're a short story writer. Don't give up on your memoir just because there seems to be a glut at the moment. I promise you, I'm not offering the single most often repeated writing advice, write what you know. Rather, I'm suggesting that you find your form. There is only one right form for a story, and if you fail to find that form, the story will not tell itself. On the idea of whether you or I have an inherent talent, whether we have a natural ability with the words that we produce, Lerner has several thoughts. In one of these comments, she cites the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, who I've always been a big fan of. To set the scene, she says, asking whether you've got it, whether you should stick with writing or quit, is a little like asking if you should continue living. It's beside the point. No one can give you a reason to live if you don't have the will. For most writers, being unable to write is tantamount to suicide anyway. Said Pablo Neruda in a Paris Review interview, For me, writing is like breathing. I could not live without breathing, and I could not live without writing. The world doesn't make full sense until the writer has secured his or her version of it on the page, and the act of writing is strangely more lifelike than life. Even when a writer doesn't have a pen in hand or a keyboard beneath his fingers, the sentences are forming, the observations are being gathered, refined, retained and rejected. The argument with the spouse, the daughter or the person at the store is being calculated, is being monitored, is being placed into our minds and reduced for a later scene. Everything, she says, is fodder. Meaning that everything we experience, everything that happens to us, it might find itself into a journal, a notebook. It might find itself into my iPad. It might find itself into that pad of paper that you've got by the side of your bed. Everything is fodder. James Thurber confessed, I never quite know when I'm not writing. Sometimes my wife comes up to me at a party and says, Damn it, Thurber, stop writing. She usually catches me in the middle of a paragraph. If as a child you moved towards the idea of writing, if you, in those childhood years, loved losing yourself in notebooks or little journals, or even making up stories in on scraps of paper and stapling them together and craning in some illustrations, that's a clue that this is a natural bent, that this is something you have to express and something you have to work on. She says, the child writer is an interesting creature. He tends to identify himself as an outsider and to be aware of an inner life at a young age. He usually has an overdeveloped sense of privacy and at eight or nine years old may already feel that he has something to hide or something to say. Here's a quote that she includes in the book from George Orwell and an essay called Why I Write. Orwell said, from a very early age, perhaps the age of five or six, I knew that when I grew up, I should be a writer. I was the middle child of three, but there was a gap of five years on either side, and I barely saw my father before I was eight. For this and other reasons, I was somewhat lonely, and I soon developed disagreeable mannerisms which made me unpopular throughout my school days. I had the lonely child's habit of making up stories and holding conversations with imaginary persons, and I think from the very start, my literary ambitions were mixed up with the feeling of being isolated and undervalued. I knew that I had a facility with words and a power of facing unpleasant facts, and I felt that this created a sort of private world in which I could get my own back for my failure in everyday life. I wish at school we had had insights into what motivated the writers we were not necessarily forced to read, but the writing that was put in front of us each term to work through and to study and to analyse, because without understanding the motivation of the writer who created that book that we had to work through at 14 or 16 or 18, it's difficult to form a full opinion of how they created and maybe why they were led to create that story. Can you see links between your childhood or your experience of growing up and how that has led you to want to capture words, to put words on paper. 
Certainly, this book has been such a positive influence for me as a writer. I actually bought this book in a bookshop in central London in 2002, only a couple of years after it came out, but I bought it immediately after having lunch with the editor of my very first book, which I wrote for the Financial Times, and Rachel suggested to me that I get this book and I take it home and I read it before I submit my final draft. So I've had this book 20 years and it continues to be in constant publication. But let's have a look at the next section. Though the writer's aim is to convey truth, says Betsy Lerner, it certainly isn't to tell the truth per se. There is simply nothing worse than a novice writer who cries out in his own defence when a scene is criticised for not seeming real, that it really happened that way. No, no, everything you put on the page is a deliberate manipulation of what happened, written to keep the reader entertained, moved, sympathetic, horrified, scared, whatever. You are never writing what really happened. Instead, you are choosing words, building images, creating a rhythm, sense and structure through which to move your characters and unfold your story. You're making a thousand minuscule choices that you hope will add up in such a way that your readers believe what they're reading is real. And this is why, when the writer is successful, the best fiction reads like non-fiction and the best non-fiction like a novel. That is an amazing piece of advice, whether we are writing fiction or non-fiction, to imbue your story with energy and to create that sense of realism that the reader will be enthralled and captured by. Often we are trying to find patterns of language and words and, and bring those together, corral them into a form that makes sense to us as the author, but which we think will make sense to the reader who is looking at the work that we create. It's natural, says Lerner, that there are people who self-doubt, that there are people who are turned to substance abuse, to alcohol, to erratic behaviour, almost sometimes to avoid the process of writing. It's not that she says that these forms of neuroses are the wrapping of procrastination. It's just that they get in the way of productive writing. And I actually really enjoyed these chapters. I didn't find them offensive or difficult or offering labelling that was inappropriate. And those have been some of the criticisms of the book. In the years that I've had this book, it's actually been a huge resource for me because it has allowed me to look at the, the struggles that really famous writers have gone through. I'm just a small-time independent published author who previously had books published with mainstream publishers, but I now love digital publishing. Looking at the struggles that other people went through, in a way, allowed me to avoid those struggles, to steer clear of over-analysis, falling into the trap of self-doubt, and to think, right, I have a book to write, I have a manuscript to produce, I have a deadline, and I have an editor who wants to see the manuscript. Let's get on with the work. Here's a, an assessment or an observation that Lerner makes, which I love and makes me giggle. Many people, Lerner says, are surprised to think that writers do not actually spend their whole day in their pyjamas. That it's not a real job. They think that we are playing with ideas, toying with ideas. And in many ways, they could be correct, except that this is actually a job. It is a thing of work that takes time and effort and energy to bring the words into formats and designs and layouts that actually make sense for the reader. Not that the people who don't read us would ever really understand that. It is actually work and in this amazing book, An Editor's Advice for Writers, Lerner talks about an interview where she was taken by a comment that Stephen King had said for Publishers Weekly. Here was a writer whose body of work at that time included more than 89 million copies of his then 27 books in print. And Stephen King said this, he said, I'd like to win the National Book Awards, the Pulitzer Prize, the Nobel Prize. I'd like to have somebody write a New York Times book review piece that says, hey, wait a minute, guys, we made a mistake. This guy is one of the great writers of the 20th century. The first one, says King, is I'm not the greatest writer of the 20th century. And the other is that once you sell a certain number of books, the people who think about literature, they stop thinking about you and they assume that any writer who is popular across a wide spectrum has nothing to say. The unspoken postulate is that intelligence is rare. It's clear in the critical stance. 
I hear it in the voice of people from the literary journals where somebody will start in the conversation by saying, I don't read Stephen King. And what they're really saying is, I don't lower myself. How wrong could they be? Writing is writing is writing. And what is popular does not mean that it is not the literature that the readership wants. And here I think Lerner is completely on track with a a theme that she starts to develop in this section of the book. She says, but most writers want prestige as much as they want money. I don't think that Stephen King would give up a single one of his millions of followers for any prize, though the exclusion of his genre by the literary establishment clearly hurts. Writers should want money. Writers deserve money. And I salute any writer who feels he is fairly compensated, but I will never believe that writers are motivated primarily by money, at least not at the outset of their careers. Writers want love, and they hope that through their work, they will be recognised as special. And that is why most writers are so crazy. When a writer gives his editor the pages of his manuscript, he is, in essence, handing over his heart on a plate. And until he gets a response, his entire self of himself is in limbo. Oh, You can't beat a cup of proper Yorkshire tea when you're sitting at your desk and recording a YouTube video. I'm a long way from Yorkshire right now, but it's so nice to have a Yorkshire tea just to lift my afternoon. Something Lerner really understands and which she conveys so well in this book is that you and I as writers are giving our third or fourth or fifth draft manuscript to an editor in the context in which she is writing the book but also we are giving those manuscripts to our advanced reader groups we are sharing them with another author friend whom we trust will be gentle with us in the way that they share their feedback for us or we are effectively after the agent has read and looked at our manuscript trusting that agent to give our manuscript to an editor at a publishing house. In these days of freelance writing, independent writing, indie publishing in particular, and the opportunity to have our manuscripts selling quickly after we finish them, it can be a mistake not to invest in the services of a good edit. It can also cut down the amount of time that it takes between finishing our fourth or fifth version of the manuscript and actually publishing it on a platform and receiving income for it as sales start to accumulate to our reader group and our readership. In respect of how an editor looks at our first approach, Lerner says, every writer has to figure out how to make his or her own way in the world, how to find support through patronage or publication. Every writer struggles each time he sends some new pages out into the world. If you're just starting out, I can tell you, she says, that editors do respond to well-written cover letters and to opening sentences that bring a manuscript to life. In fact, an editor can usually tell from a cover letter the person's facility with words. Some letters are so stiff and stilted they are almost painful to read. Others use the language to keen and clever effect within the lines a promise of what is to come. On this channel, I've covered multiple times the whole idea of procrastination, but let's look at something which is more realistic than procrastination because there are solutions and formulas by which you and I can actually pick up a pen or pick up the keyboard and start writing again. But rejection is something else which affects us deeply when we send our manuscripts out into the world. And Lerner explains to you and I as writers what that rejection can mean If you are still unpublished, then rejection, as Lerner very much says, is a part of the writing life. It is a part of the process of picking up your work, sending it out to somebody who may review it and consider it for forwarding to a publishing house, or for somebody who may say, look, Nick, Susie, Billy, Mary, this isn't up to scratch. This is not ready for a paying readership. This book is in need of work or direction or the characterization is poor or the story has breaks in it that are not obviously making sense to the new reader it needs to be polished 
A rejection like that is pure gold because there is the nugget of possibility within the letter that you receive back or the email that comes back in response to you having submitted the first few chapters of the manuscript you were asked to submit and send in. On the subject of rejection, Lerner says something very useful. She says, if you're just starting out, try to look at rejection as a ladder. The first rung is made up of form letters, the pre-printed kind that offer some trite condolence why your work isn't right for that literary journal, magazine, or for actual publication as a book. The next rung might still be form letters, but now an editor has scrawled a note. Try as again, make this amendment, do this thing, see what else can be done. If it's a physical letter, the signature is usually ineligible, a common tactic to keep the writer from getting his or her hopes up by imagining that he might actually develop a relationship with the editor, or worse yet, try to call. The next rung may seem like a very small step, but it includes detail on what the editor considers is missing, where things may be improved for greater benefit in the longer term, and how you as the writer might actually seek to make those changes. One of the famous stories obviously about rejection that you and I have all heard is the one of John Grisham, who while he was working as a junior lawyer in a large firm and working 40, 50, 60 hour weeks and more, over a period of three years, penned the manuscript for his first book, A Time to Kill. It was published by a now defunct group called Witchwood Publishing, and they ordered 5,000 copies. Grisham himself brought the first 2,000 copies and was going door to door in bookshops, selling the first of, of those himself. And it was a slow beginning, but as soon as he finished the first book, he started on the second very famous book called The Firm, which many of us have read, many of us saw the film years ago when it came out. But that book was completely different. While his book was still in submission to various publishing houses and multiple submissions were being made at once, a copy got leaked to Hollywood and he had a $600,000 advance from Paramount for the film rights for a book that had still not been sold to a publisher. So the process of submission and the process of writing books and sequels and follow-up books and new manuscripts is something that never stops. Writing a one-off book and never writing another is a rare process by which you find success as an author. But the process of sending out submissions and proposals to publishing houses through your literary agent, through your writer's agent, is incredibly significant and very important in your journey as a writer where you are seeking to be published along the traditional route. If you're submitting manuscripts and you're getting results, then that's the best thing that can possibly happen. To be rejected and to take it personally isn't going to help you, it's not going to allow you to move things forward. There is more to persistence in the writing game than there is luck. Often you can write a book and not submit it enough times. You can write a book and not send advanced reader copies out to enough of your friends and your social network, and I mean by your social network, authors who have an understanding of the written word and can really appreciate what you've created. But it's the persistence, it's the sending that out one more time, it's the approaching one more person for the cover art if you're an indie publisher and author and you want to find the right cover for your book so that when you place it on one of the big platforms, it will be visible as a thumbnail and readers will resonate with the imagery that allows them to then click on the details of the book. Just because somebody sends you the first piece of artwork doesn't mean you need to accept it for your book cover because it might be the fourth or the seventh or the ninth image that strikes a note and really will call people's attention to the brilliant book that is hiding behind that cover. And getting people's opinion, finding feedback from other authors and fellow writers is hugely important. If you don't belong to a writing group, consider creating one. And to sit down in a room with 10 or 12 other writers, we used to use coffee shops every week. We'd sit down at six in the evening, write for an hour, and then have a coffee and a natter and head home to our different locations. Consider forming a group, consider finding and building that community of fellow scribblers with whom you can share ideas and look at what it is that is in the manuscript that you think is ready for a readership to consume and to appreciate. 
writing is nothing if not a long distance race and it takes tenacity and persistence and stubbornness often to go from your first finished manuscript to seeing that book in the hands of an editor or in the hands of an ARC group and taking it out to publication, either in a traditional role or through the indie publishing route. But it does take that ongoing self-belief that we, as the writer of the work, can actually take it forward and can push it into a marketplace where it belongs and where it deserves to have readers who appreciate it and give us the positive feedback in their comments and their reviews. Be part of a group, be part of a sharing of what it is that makes you feel that you are passionate about and you you need to speak about the work that you're creating. That will go a long way into either helping you find an editor, helping you find a route to publication, or simply will allow you to lift yourself up on those days when things are difficult and you haven't got any Yorkshire tea to keep you going. Having that point of contact, having that additional support can do amazing things for you because it will get you through the days when you don't want to write. It will get you through the days when you just have had enough and another hour staring at a screen is just beyond your capacity to tolerate. When my first books were published in the early 2000s, I was supported by a major publishing house and I would take every opportunity possible to go to events, trade shows, public conferences and get myself on the speaking calendar where I could have 20 minutes talking about the themes within the books that I was then writing. And that gave me the opportunity for something which I had not anticipated as a writer, which is where people would come up to you in the audience after the event and shake your hand and say, thank you so much, your book had the most profound influence or because of your book, I was able to do this. And here Lerner talks about that process because I think it's a very important part of the author experience and she really nails it she says there is always more than one way to skin a cat as the expression goes and if you've got great writing or communication skills something new or necessary to say the focus and the drive and a certain amount of quixotic self-belief then i will believe you will be heard from obviously writing a novel and writing a self-help book are entirely different endeavors but as an editor i will venture to say that all authors at heart are not so different from one another. All are driven by an idea to share their stories and ideas and to connect with other people. All believe in the power of the written word and in the power of the book. The novelist wants to change people's lives by transporting them into a story. The journalist wants to find the story hidden in plain view. The self-help author wants to help people effect change in their lives. The greatest compliment any writer can hear from a reader are the words, Your book changed my life. Let me say that again. You can hear from somebody about a story you've written and they will say, I was completely enthralled and wrapped up in that story. And when the pages, when I turned the final page and the book finished, I was left speechless. Or what you wrote in your self-help book has completely allowed us to change our family situation or to improve our budget or to save for the future according to what you write and the stories that you create we write in isolation not so much splendid isolation but simply in a room with nobody else sometimes with music sometimes without this afternoon there's nobody here there's just me my radio and a cup of tea and i will do some writing after this video i'm recording here for youtube but this is my study i have books on the wall over there i have a painting i have a screen I have a radio, it's a pens, and notebooks, and more and more pens. But this is, this is me. But we write in isolation. And when we write, what Betsy Lerner says is that writers want to know that they are not alone. After the long struggle to find an editor and a publisher, a writer wants to feel that he has found some protection, some support. A contract for a book is symbolic of many things not least of which is the implied commitment of another person to see you and your book through. The writer wants a relationship with his publisher and the physical embodiment of that relationship is usually the editor. When my first books were published, it was by a national publishing house in the UK, but with an international reach. And so my first books were published in several languages. But I had a brilliant editor called Rachel. And I always felt like I had her looking over my shoulder when I was sitting at my desk at home 
and struggling with a new chapter that needed to be done that week. It was knowing that she had an expectation of receiving the next piece of work that really allowed me to knuckle down and write new content for those first few books. I would send out a couple of chapters, she would give me some feedback a week or two weeks later, and then I could ensure that the next version of either a fresh chapter or a revision of what had just been written could be done in such a way that the future reader would have a positive response to that book when it was finished. Lerner in her book says this about a good editor. She says, A good editor, whether for fiction or non-fiction, crouches like a coach on the edge of the track, his stopwatch grasped tightly in hand, clocking a writer's progress as each sentence strides toward the finish. Sometimes merely breaking a long paragraph in two can take a few seconds off a writer's time. Sometimes breaking apart a longer chapter can give a feeling of movement and breadth. A writer can use paragraphs and space breaks the way a poet uses stanzas, each one setting forth a new beginning, signalling to the reader that we are going through another door. A writer uses these devices to say, here, this way, come with me, or take a breather, refill your glass, get into your pyjamas, and then we'll read one more chapter before sleep. I hope you've enjoyed this superb book. It's just my take sharing sections from a book that I've enjoyed for almost two decades. But it's called An Editor's Advice to Writers, The Forest for the Trees by Betsy Lerner. I'm going to wrap up on just a couple of little paragraphs that are a perfect way to close this review of such an amazing book. Writers want justice. They want some insurance that their drive, their will, their hope and their delusions their madness and profligacy and their fierce self-belief will produce work of lasting value. What writers want is to be taken on their own terms, to have their books praised or panned according to their own stated or implicit goals, not according to the whim and the prejudices of critics who say they should have attempted something different. And Lerner finishes herself on this final chapter saying, no matter how lonely or driven you or I are as writers, no matter how many others we would gladly trample or shove in front of an oncoming car so that our own words could emerge triumphant, what we want as writers more than anything else, what we want as writers, what writers want more than good editing and smart marketing and 10 city tours and two book contracts and appreciation, call that worship, and lucrative movie deals and fancy prizes, what we want more than all of these things our readers, loyal, avid readers. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you've enjoyed this book review. An editor's advice for writers, The Forest for the Trees, written by the editor Betsy Lerner.